Okay. Uh, if there are questions or comments, Zentai, feel free to interrupt or let me know at any time. We're going to look at a preview of today's topic before we go into the slides. Whoops, that's not the preview. I want to press play. <clears throat> So this is on the topic of, surprise, surprise, streak surface construction. So on Monday evening, we went over stream surface construction. And today is a follow-up lecture on the topic of streak surface construction. So what you can see there is a streak surface. So there's flow coming in from this side, moving past the square cylinder, and then having different kinds of <coughs> consequences or interactions with that square cylinder after it passes. Now, a streak surface is analogous to dropping a massless 2D sheet into a flow and then watching what happens to it as it gets pushed around by the flow. So the whole surface is dynamic. Can everybody see how the whole surface is changing at every time step? It's a dynamic surface, and it's not always tangent to the flow everywhere, like stream lines and uh, path lines and, and stream surfaces and, and path surfaces. So it doesn't have to be tangent to the flow. So that's what it looks like when you drop a massless infinitely thin surface into the flow and then you get to watch it deform that and that deformation is showing the characteristics of the flow after after it interacts all these simulations are usually testing like what is the flow behavior when it interacts with an object in this case the object is pretty simple it's a square cylinder, but the, the flow dynamics are certainly not very, very simple, right? That's some complicated flow behavior. And if this is the same simulation, but now this is the seating curve here, and it, it's orthogonal to the uh, square cylinder, so the, the streak surface intersects the object and then breaks apart, and then moves around moves around the square cylinder and then you can watch what happens to the two independent pieces of the cylinder of the streak surface after it's colliding with the cylinder this might remind you of something and really what it's analogous to is adding dye into flow so dye being color, so if you just take flow and you squeeze in dye of color, it's, it's, it's similar to this kind of behavior. <clears throat> One of the things I really like about streak surfaces in flow visualization like this is that it's very, very alive. It feels like something that's alive. You know, it's it's... It's not just a static kind of dead thing. It's a, it's a kind of behavior that we see in, in nature. And it has a nice organic property to it. And if anybody can remember the stream surfaces, the stream surfaces from last Monday were static, right? They, they don't necessarily move. The motions that we added to those stream surfaces were synthetic. You know, we animated the textures and so on. But this motion is a response to the unsteady flow. So in the case of stream surfaces, it was steady state flow, or flow that did not change over time. And in this case, it's flow that changes over time. So it's, it's every time step the flow is, is changing. And then the surface is responding to those changes. And you can also notice, by the way, that the flow often exhibits divergent behavior. 
that's the most common case out of the di there's the divergent, convergent, and shearing behavior that we talked about last Monday. But the most common case is divergence flow. So there's a, there's a, a streak surface interacting with the Hurricane Isabel simulation. That's the coast of our uh, one of your former Commonwealth countries, the U.S. <laughs> we got kicked out of the Commonwealth. Uh, oh well. Anyways, that's a preview of, of what we're going to be looking at right now. Kicked out of the Commonwealth from misbehavior, misbehaving. And this is all part of our lecture on geometric flow visualization. So this is streak surface construction for 3D unsteady flow fields. So the input to this algorithm is a 3D unsteady vector field. So that means for every data sample, there's an X, Y, Z, and temporal component, just like with Betty. So Betty is, is this way. You don't have to look at Betty as an unsteady flow base. Betty, I'm sorry, um, Sally. Sally is an unsteady flow base, but you're not required in assignment two to consider the time-dependent aspect of Sally. But every data sample has X, Y, Z, and a temporal component or a time step associated with it. it so it reflects direction, magnitude, <clears throat> and this is what it looks like when you visualize a 3D vector field with arrow glyphs. So that's what it looks like. It's good for getting an overview. And usually we get our data from CFE simulations. That's usually where our flow viz data come, comes from. And remember, these flow fields are changing at every single time step. So it makes it complicated. You're looking at one time step in assignment two. But here we're talking about hundreds of time steps. So you can imagine assignment three being like the time-dependent version of assignment two or something. That would be a fun assignment. Now, as a little uh, refresher, we did mention it once, but we'll mention it again. Streak lines. What are streak lines? The curves formed by joining all particles passing through the same point in space at different times. So if you can imagine a position in space, right, and then flow moving past that position, and then adding particles at that spot, at that position, periodically, at say two hertz, two times a second, and then watching them move, get carried away by the flow, a streak line is the curve that connects, that joins all those points together. So it's multiple points being joined together. And it's analogous to injecting dye into the flow. Now, streak surfaces are an extension of streak lines. So in our implementation, what we do is we have a seeding curve or an edge. So it's no longer just a point, it's an edge like a line segment. And then we inject uh, edges into the flow at periodic frequencies, and we join the edges together. But that's what today's lecture is about. How do you construct streak surfaces? How do you actually generate them? So, but at least now you have the conceptual idea of, of what they are. So these are challenging. <laughs> like you might have got that idea from the video already that this is a challenging topic. <clears throat> so the computational cost of the surface advection is very expensive. That advection means the motion, the flow, with pushing the all the vertices in the surface in the direction of the flow. 
using numerical integration techniques that we are reviewing. So that is an expensive computation. And that's for a, a more than one reason, but the, the main reason is the surface is entirely dynamic. That means every vertex is, has to be updated at every time step. If anybody noticed with the stream surfaces, the only vertices we were updating <coughs> were the ones at the front of the surface. As soon as we created the surface, it remained static. It was only the vertices at the front that we were updating. But now we update every vertex in the surface every single time step. So you could see that the whole surface was moving. <clears throat> So the surface is composed, composed of a mesh, and then the mesh quality, has, we want the mesh quality to be high. So we want the sampling rate of the vector field to be high. If it wasn't, you would end up seeing these flat spaces in the, in the, in the mesh. You'd end up seeing like polygons that are flat. From, and that, those would be called aliasing artifacts. Or you could have polygons that get crunched together, and again, you'd find aliasing artifacts in the surface due to shading. And the, the complexities are, this hopefully rings a bell for many of you, with, same with the stream surface case, are divergent flow, convergent flow, and shear. Shear is when the flow moves in a curve. And, of course, objects in the domain and critical points, like things that interfere with the flow of the streak surface. Right? It will collide with things or hit a critical point, like a sink or source. And we also have to be careful with the way we manage our data, because the data doesn't typically fit into memory all at the same time. We typically load one time step into memory, do our processing, release that time step and process the next one. So <clears throat> this method tries something slightly untraditional, which is a mesh composed of quads. Anybody remember what surfaces are usually composed of when you study computer graphics, for example? Somebody, I think somebody said it. Triangles. Triangles, exactly. That's usually what surfaces are composed of. So in this lesson, we try an experiment. We try to compose surfaces with quads. You gonna sign that one? Yeah. Okay. Anybody need the attendance register? <coughs> So the surfaces are constructed using quads, and the idea is that we update every quad in the surface on a quad by quad basis, and hopefully that sounds familiar. It's inspired by the marching cubes strategy that processes the isosurfaces on a cube by cube basis. Thus no global optimization is required, everything is local. And the idea is that it's good for memory management. And that gives us, that means we can handle large surfaces. It's a CPU based implementation, which is very old fashioned, so to speak. But it's still fast. Right? We can still construct streak surfaces at interactive frame rates. It doesn't need to fit into GPU memory. And this is an example of one of the surface meshes. So that is a sur streak surface mesh, and if you look very closely, it's composed of quads, <coughs> as opposed to triangles. <clears throat> but there is a catch. <laughs> when you compose meshes with quads, you get into these kind of 
topological configurations that add some complexity to the mesh. So we have to introduce some data structures here. A list of vertices or particles and that they create the mesh themselves. So in this diagram, those are the small black ellipses. We need to maintain a list of quads. In this diagram, this is a quad, a four-sided polygon. Every quad has a pointer to its neighbors. For example, its west neighbor or east neighbor, north neighbor or south neighbor. And then, sometimes, the quads change their resolution. This is the complexity, so they're not all the same resolution. Some quads are bigger than others, due to those properties of the flow, like divergence, convergence, and shear. And when that happens, we end up with a configuration like this. And this, this thing that really is the object that enables this change in resolution is called a T-junction. Anybody been to the Junction Cafe in Swansea? Nobody's been there? It's a great cafe. I highly recommend it. It's really good. It's not called the T-junction though. It's just called the Junction. <laughs> so here's a T-junction. And therefore, this quad has to store some extra information. So it stores an extra vertex and extra neighbor information, right? And so does this quad. So we have a northern neighbor, we have a western neighbor, we have an eastern neighbor, a southern neighbor, but we also have to store the T-junction uh, so that we can keep track of the tr these transitions. And we have this constraint here that only one T-junction is allowed on each edge. You can't have an edge with multiple T-junctions. That would add too much complexity to the mesh, and it would, it would be unmanageable. No? Yep. For that one, does the one with QW in it, how does it distinguish between the two? It has to know about its T-junction. So anytime you have an edge with a T-junction on it, you must know about it. Otherwise, you'll be in big trouble, so to speak. So this W is uh, means west, by the way. We're using these west, east, north, and south conventions right? in, in the... Uh, notation. And by the way, it's hard to see, but there's an extra vertex there in the T-junction that corresponds to this one, right? So every edge has two vertices. But this edge is really two edges now, because it's been subdivided into two. So that's the basic data structures we need to get this to work. <clears throat> And then, what does the algorithm itself look like? It looks like this. We seed, we start with a seeding rake, so an edge where we insert the streak surface, which you saw in the video. Then we advance the front, so to speak, so we start integrating the vertices, the first vertices in the direction of the flow. That's called integrate vertices. And then, this is where the complexity is. Well, a lot of the complexity. The next stage is to remove terminated vertices and quads. So terminated vertices and quads are those that have left the boundary. Like they hit the boundary and they're no longer inside the flow domain, so to speak. So those are the first things we check for to remove those. Then we check for divergent quads or divergent flow. And we handle that somehow in the future slide, the next slide, for example. 
we look for a convergent flow. So divergent flow is flow that's like separating. Convergent flow is flow that's coming together. And then the shear flow is a flow that's curving in one direction. <clears throat> we test for those conditions. and We have to update the quads in a special way. We update the sampling rate in mesh depending on if it's a divergent, convergent, or shear flow. Then we test for boundary conditions. That means exiting the domain or intersecting with an object in the flow, like we saw in the demo videos, or a, a, a critical point. We test to see if we've reached the last time step in the simulation data. If no, we repeat for, until all the time steps have run out. If, if yes, we stop the integration and, and render the surface. So conceptually, it's actually an easy algorithm, conceptually. It's just update every vertex, test for, sh for divergence, convergence, and shear. And, and render the surface conceptually. It's not very difficult. It's the technical details that are difficult. So this is what happens to quads in divergent flow, how we handle divergent flow. Mm. So if this is, if this is a quad, Right, and each vertex, by the way, has been labeled. This vertex is southwest, this vertex is southeast, northeast, and northwest. We're always looking at the distance between vertices, DCEP. We're testing the distance between all the vertices. It's just like marching cubes in the sense that, remember, we tested every single vertex to see if it was above or below an ISO value. So again, we're testing every edge to see how far, how long it is in each quad. If the, if the uh, vertices are too far apart, we start to undersample the vector field. And that will re result in a less accurate surface and aliasing artifacts. So in this case, what we do, if, if the vertices reach a distance of DCEP away from one another, we split the quad into two, like this. So we introduced two T-junctions and two new vertices. And that's what, that's what it looks like. And this is the same image. This is the same thing, but just rotated 90 degrees, that one below. So it's, it's just the case where it's not the northern edge. That's where the vertices are too far apart. It's the eastern edge where the vertices are too far apart. And then we split the quad along the, uh, the east edge and west edges. Does that make sense? And by the way, it's hard to see, but there are two new vertices in the mesh there. <coughs> so two new vertices. So that's the, equi the equivalent of saying we've updated the sampling rate of the vector field. Convergence is a little bit trickier. It doesn't happen as often. It's trickier. So instead of a quad splitting, a quad collapses, so to speak. And this occurs when neighboring particles are too close together. Look, I've even... I've even used the Queen's English here for you guys. This is the case when two vertices, V northwest and V north, 
have come too close together. They're far less than DCEP, our DCEP threshold. Not only is that true here, but it's also true here. We want it, we want it to be true in both, both cases. So we have to test both sides of the quads to make sure that the vertices are too close together. That's what this less than D sept means, and that's what this less than D sept means. That's the same D sept as in the evenly spaced streamlines algorithm, by the way. It's all the same parameter. It's a separating distance. When this edge is too short and this edge is too short, we remove this edge, the edge that connects V north to V south, and the new quad looks like this. But it has a T junction now. <clears throat> so that's the complexity. It's not, it's not completely reduced in complexity. And the bottom is the exact same thing, the exact same case, rotated by 90 degrees. <clears throat> and you have different cases, the different quad configurations where this can happen. This is one quad configuration where we end up with two G, two G junctions afterwards. This is another quad configuration where we end up with only one T junction. That's, this, that's the case we've drawn in detail here. But we can also end up with a case, this is the same as case one, by the way. It's just rotated 180 degrees, where we end up with two T junctions. The most common case is case two, which is what we've drawn here. <clears throat> but if this edge continued on here, question? Um. Yeah, in the left-hand images, it looks like um, the south vertex has moved to the center of the edge. Is that the case, or is that just how it's drawn? Yes, you, you're right. It's it's just how it's drawn. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't actually move. It's just a schematic. Good observation. What's your name? Uh, Joe. Joe. Very good. Very good. <coughs> you that that kind of attention to detail is very very good for computer science. That's what, it, that's what computer science requires. It's like it requires extreme attention to detail. I'm sure everybody noticed that. That's like the first thing you learn in computer science 101. It's like, you're missing a semicolon. You're like, what? Anyways, yes. <clears throat> so that's the case of when two quads converge. And this is the most complex case, is the case of shearing, when the, cur when the, when the flow curves right, in one direction. And this is what it looks like. This is what happens to a quad mesh when it curves. And we end up with these quads that look like this. The ideal quad looks like this, because it has 90 degree interior angles. And the more that the angles, interior angles, deviate from the 90 degrees, the more likely it is to end up in aliasing artifacts. So this is a quite a, uh, a complicated diagram. <clears throat> but what we're doing what we're trying to show here is a quad, this one, that is sheared, like this one. And what we're testing for is not quite the same as in the previous cases. We're not necessarily as interested in the separating distance between the edges anymore. We're testing a different condition. And that condition is the length, I'm sorry, I take it back, we are testing the separating distance between edges, uh, vertices, but they're diagonally across from each other, not next to each other along the same side. 
So we're testing the distance between V north east and V southwest. That's what this blue edge is indicating. And we're also testing the distance between V northwest and V southeast. That's what that other blue edge is. And if one of those edges is much greater than the other by a certain threshold, the ratio of those two edges, we have a shear case, a shear quad. Gesundheit. Now the diagram is complicated, but what we end up doing is not that complicated. So we have this case where this diagonal is a lot greater, say double the size of this diagonal. Hopefully everybody can see that. What ends up happen happening topologically is this edge simply gets connected to this edge. So it used to be here, and now it's been reconnected here to form a nicer quad. Everybody notice that? And then the T-junction conceptually used to be here, and it moved up here. So that's the, that's the change. It just, this edge that used to be here got pushed, got refitted, so to speak, one vertex down. And then the T-junction was created as a result of that new fitting. Can everybody see that? <clears throat> now, this is a nicer case where the same thing happens, but there's a T-junction facing this way. How is it facing? It's facing this way here. This one's facing this way. This is, a, this is the, like the dream case, actually. <laughs> it's the dream case. It's the same tests, right? Very long diagonal and a very short diagonal. Same test, same case. But when we snap the new edge to its new position, here's the edge that we refit. We refit it, refit it directly across we get to delete two T-junctions. We get to just make them disappear. So the complexity of the mesh is reduced by two T-junctions, and one of the quads is more square. These are complicated diagrams for something that's conceptually very simple. It's not simple to implement, but conceptually it's very simple. <clears throat> If you can imagine just taking two edges, you know, two rows of vertices and shifting them like this, that's all that's happening really on a conceptual level. Yeah. Did that make any sense, hopefully? Well, well if on the first diagram, I don't know if you said this before, but so you obviously it's sort of the worst angle on the bottom side, but after you've switched it, so that, uh, sorry, on the top side, yes, you switch it from the top to the bottom of the vertices, leaving the T-junction above it. Yeah. What if then the upper left quad there was worse than the original positive the lower left quad was? So you sort of switch it, would it be to switch back then? That's right. That's a, that's a good question. It, it's Ben, right? Yeah. So Ben asks, what if you end up leaving another quad worse than worse off? <clears throat> In the way this is drawn, that, that usually doesn't happen, but I will try to answer it anyways. You can see like this quad ends up looking nicer. And same here, this quad ends up looking nicer. But Ben is asking, well, what happens if somehow this one ends up looking worse off, like it's more sheared as a result of this? What will happen is it depends on the order in which you process the quads. But this test is done to all the quads. It's just testing quad, doing it over and over again. So if I test this quad first and then this quad, then nothing will happen. 
But if I test this quad first, and then this one, it could actually get flipped back, if you know what I mean. So you could have this kind of flipping back and forth. Now imagine I test this quad first and then this quad second, right, and this one's worse off. What will happen is the algorithm will reiterate all and start at the beginning again. Remember that, the overview diagram? It just iterates over and over again. So it tests all these things, updates all the meshes, and then just continues going. So you could theoretically have this case where you're flipping up and down all the time. It could happen. It hasn't happened in our experience, but it could theoretically happen. Yeah. It's, it wouldn't, it's very unlikely, though. It's very unlikely because usually vertices move together. You know, they don't move necessarily independently. If they are moving independently, that means they are diverging, and then the quad will end up getting split. Okay, uh, a, com a complexity, a kind of wrinkle, pun intended, in the, in the topology. When I say that word topology, it just means the nodes or the vertices and the connections between them. It can happen that you end up with a quad that looks like this, a T-junction, say, on two edges, so it doesn't matter. Could be, could be uh, four T-junctions, anywhere from one to four T-junctions. Now, at every time step, these vertices are integrated. That means they're pushed in the direction of the flow, or sometimes we say the word convective direction of the flow. And it can happen that those T-junction vertices are advected or pushed off the edges of their quads. So this one has been pushed in this direction. It's no longer on the edge between its vertices, <coughs> between its neighboring vertices. And the same is true about this one. So a hole has opened up in the surface. That's what those gray regions are there, like holes. So in that case, we don't, we, we don't use quads anymore. We just render those vertices using a triangle fan. So we convert the quad to a triangle fan, just for that one uh, rendering. The, all the data structures are the same. The data structures stay the same. But just the way we render, we don't render it as a quad anymore. We render it as a triangle fan. So the, these things, this information does not disappear. It's just when we render the surface, we, we choose to render it as a set of triangles, which is kind of funny. I heard everybody laughing because we said it's a quad-based uh, streak surface. So we're, it's like cheating a little bit. But <clears throat> okay. Everybody ready to see the, the video again now that you know how it works? <clears throat> it will look different this time. Now the the thing the thing is when you look at it now, it will be different. We don't have a video, we don't have an example that shows the original mesh as far as I remember, like without the quads. But now you know how it works, and you know that all the computations that are taking place at every single time step, it's complicated. It's a lot of computations. So for that whole mesh, Every, at every single time step, it's traversing the entire mesh, every quad, checking every vertex, invecting the vertex, testing the distances between all the edges, testing the distances of all the diagonals, splitting quads, con uh, collapsing quads, 
and then updating the topology of quads for shear. So it's doing all those three things for every single edge in the mesh at every single time step. So it's computationally very expensive. That is why you probably will never see streak surfaces outside of this class because they're still complicated and they're still computationally expensive. Uh, but but maybe, maybe they'll start to gain some popularity, who knows. But right now they're still very unpopular because of their complexity and uh, computational complexity and uh, algorithmic complexity. But they certainly are very um, helpful if you're trying to study unsteady 3D flow, but if you're trying to understand the characteristics of unsteady 3D flow. <clears throat> so that is just the ability of the algorithm to handle intersections with objects. Everybody remembers what the color is mapped to? Who remembers what the color is mapped to? Anyone? Density. 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 Any other guesses? Magnitude. Flow magnitude. That's right, the speed. That's right. So this is slow flow, and then the red is fast flow, so to speak, or relatively fast. And you can see this, it's, it's splitting up into different pieces. And some of the pieces uh, don't even attach anymore to their original surface. Right there. They're completely independent. So it's really not just one streak surface here, but a number of streak surfaces at the same time, because the one is splitting up into different pieces. What I always wanted to do was add sound to the video, like some sounds. Uh, we never got to that point. Yeah. So that's a seeding curve. And that's the, uh, what happens to the flow as the seeding, as we release the streak surface into the flow using the seeding curve. Some of you might even recognize that. That, um, that image. So this is a Hurricane Isabel simulation. That's just, you know, a, it's a very, very large streak surface. So it, it looks like a, a wave or something. It's a street surface probably the size of, of Maryland or something like that. It's a little bit hard to see with the um, colors there. Any questions about streak surfaces? Mm. Of course, a video, that video is, of course, available on the database YouTube channel if you're interested in looking at it again. Otherwise, we will stop here. Okay, see you later. Thank you very much. Can I ask you a question?
Yes, let me just stop this for a second. There's an Indian still at the foot of the hill. The smoke curls up to the sky. Why I wait for the smell, you can plainly tell. There's pochi and brew nearby. For it fills the air with a perfume rare between both me and you. We'll take a sup or drink a cup or a buck for the mountain dew. I did I love my Other airport chain from my early 